Good evening from Westminster City Hall and welcome to this, the first in our series of open forum events for 2021. To borrow a phrase, tonight is all about the move from jabs to jobs. That's revitalising the economy of Westminster, how we do that across our local high streets, across our markets and, of course, across the West End. Well, exploring that issue with us is tonight's panel, Council Leader Rachel Robethon, Councillor Matthew Green, who leads on business, Heather Acton, Cabinet Member for Communities and Regeneration, Serena Simon, Programme Director for the Church Street Regeneration Scheme, and Debbie Jackson, our Executive Director of Growth Planning and Housing. As in previous sessions, this is your chance to put a question to any member of our panel, and you can do that using the question box on the right of your screen. But I wonder if I can start this evening, Rachel, with an opening thought from you. The West End looks busier, obviously the pavements are busier, the streets clearly are, but what is the reality under the bonnet in terms of visitors and office workers coming back? What's the mood you sense? Uh, well, Fergus, it is beginning to come back to life, and that's wonderful. And I've been out and about. I've been visiting um, all of our uh, areas uh, in the West End, and things are beginning to come back to life, as you rightly said. But let's be clear, the West End in particular has been really hard hit by this, and it's going to take a long time for us to get back to normal levels. Um, people aren't coming back into the center, city centre in the, in the numbers that they used to. So still, even after May 17th, with the reopening of internal hospitality, we know that footfall is still 60% down. And of course, international tourism is going to take a long time to recover. And a lot of our cultural industries uh, and, and other areas are very dependent on international tourism. So it's going to take a long time uh, for it to come back. And that's why we need to continue to support um, hospitals hospitality and all of those other businesses uh, through this. And let's be clear, this is important because jobs depend on this. 80,000 jobs depend on the hospitality in the West End. So this is really important um, for London as a whole, but for Westminster residents for their jobs. So we need to continue to support those businesses. The Alfresco scheme has been really important getting grants out to businesses, lobbying for business rate relief, uh, but it's going to be it's going to take a long time. From some of the questions, let me drop on one specific thing, and that's office workers coming back, about which we have read much. Now, uh, I'm sure of course everyone wants to see them come back, but do you, do you not think the world of work has now changed forever? Are people really going to be doing these nine to five, five day a week uh, jobs they used to do? Well, it's a very good question. Of course, we don't know. But the truth is that uh, I suspect that uh, the world of jobs will change, that people will move towards a more flexible style. But I'm sure that people will still come back into the city centre, will come back into offices. But it's, but it's a fair point that in the, in the absence of office workers in the previous numbers, um, and let's just to put it in context, we've got a city of a quarter of a million people. And pre-pandemic, over a million came in every day to work or to or to visit um, the West End. So it's a very significant market. But in the absence of office workers coming back in, in the same numbers that they did before, we need to be doing everything we can to encourage people to visit uh, domestic tourism and showcase everything that's so fabulous about the West End that we've got to offer. You know, the cultural offer is, is unrivaled here. And we need to do everything we can to really uh, show that people can come back safely and enjoy that. You mentioned one million there. Will we ever return to the heady days of one million? <laughs> well, I don't know. I don't know, Fergus. Um, and it's, it, it's going to be a long time off. But in the meantime, we need to do everything we can to give people confidence that they can come back safely, that they can travel on public transport, that they can move around safely, that our businesses are managing their spaces safely so that they can, can come back and enjoy this. Well, the council has the job of making our streets safe for visitors and those who work here, but also for making infrastructure uh, work for businesses. At Tatchbrook Market, new smart bollards have been installed where, to make life tidier for the traders. Let's hear their verdict. My name is Rabi Haneti, and uh, I own uh, the Jordanian Cuisine store in Tatchbrook Market. The new bollards, they were introduced to keep the market uh, tidy and to avoid like trip hazards because before we have like uh, like the cables running around the markets uh, but these pullers now inside the stall so no more like cables outside no trip hazards so it's more safe for us and for our customers uh, they are for electricity so they supply all electricity so for fridges for cooking so we use it for preparation yeah 
Uh, it's really amazing because it's really handy and quick. You just scan the bar using your phone, your, your card is registered already, and you just start your session. And you, it's like a pay as you go. So whatever you consume, you pay for. You don't consume, you don't pay, which is really great. Yeah. Debbie Jackson, smart bollards. Is that what 21st century market is all about? Are we now hopelessly outdated in how we think about markets? No, of course not. I think, you know, markets um, have always been and will always be such an important part of our city, um, beloved of local communities and, of course, a total lifeline over the pandemic as well. Um, they're such important places where um, our communities can uh, go and shop and meet their neighbours and meet their local communities. There are also places where our diverse communities find expression through the foods that are sold there um, and the goods that are sold there. Um, but also economically, they're a, an easy route to, um, to market for some uh, entrepreneurs and people who are just starting out. So they're a really important part of our city um, and, and we work really hard to support them and work with our traders across Westminster. Um, on the smart point, I think what, what, what you just saw there in that brilliant clip is an investment into infrastructure to make it as easy as possible to trade on a market. Um, and we're um, investing across the city through our smart city priority on uh, an infrastructure to, to use this extraordinary fabric of the city to really demonstrate and trial some innovations and make it as easy as possible to move around our city, to be in our city, um, but also um, doing clever things like decarbonizing our city, drawing carbon out of the atmosphere, um, and also using data to make sure we and partners can make the smartest decisions as possible in the work that we do um, to support our residents and the businesses in the city. Heather, can I pick up the point on communities and, and the role of markets there? I mean, they, they serve a value beyond the obvious there, don't they? They've been there for so long and they're really part of the fabric. Yes, and as Debbie said, they, they were really so important when uh, so many things were closed um, during COVID. Uh, so they've been incredibly important for the communities. Um, and as Debbie also said, um, they're, they're a very diverse offering uh, in the many markets. Um, and it's not just food offerings, um, it's looking at um, other specialist um, e um, uh, activities and um, commodities from, from the markets. They have been uh, really important and we will continue to support them. Well, some of the questions now coming in on particular points. Councillor Green, question with your name on it. Shops in Harrow Road, particularly towards the Maida Vale end, what are we doing to upgrade those? And that comes from uh, Gwen C. Well, uh, I, I spent a lot of time on the, on shopping on the Harrow Road myself, from the supermarkets like Iceland and the co-op to the, to the little local businesses, the butchers, the greengrocers. And, and as Debbie was saying about our, um, our markets, our, uh, our local high streets have also been a real lifeline to people during the coronavirus period. And that's why the, uh, it, we're not just here to talk about uh, supporting the West End. We also want to support all the local high streets across our city. Um, Harrow Road in particular, we're going to be investing um, £2 million in a Harrow Road place plan, which will improve the shopping environment, but also improve connectivity um, uh, in that area. We'll be linking up uh, uh, Westbourne Green with, uh, with, with the area besides the, the canal and making that, that area a much more pleasant place for people to, to, to shop and also hopefully increasing footfall and therefore allowing those local businesses to, to have higher revenues and employ more local people, which is what we want to do. Also on Harrow Road, we, we have another market there. Um, we, we have the Maida Hill, Maida Hill Market. We, we're making similar investments into those markets. Um, Debbie talked about the smart, smart bollards, but across our markets in the city, we're investing £600,000 in providing Wi-Fi to tra for traders. So we really are upgrading those spaces, um, including in the Harrow Road area. And I think the important thing to stress here, is, as Matthew said, is that, is that we're co curating this with the local residents because this is for the local residents. These are their community spaces, the areas that they go to shop. And so we need to work with the local residents and get their input into what sort of offer they want and how this should look for them. Well, certainly one thing that uh, questions are coming in about very directly, <coughs> excuse me, is jobs 
And I'd like to put this to Serena and Heather. What support could Westminster offer to employers and residents to enable them to be employed in the local economy? Serena, as, as one who lives among entrepreneurs and budding entrepreneurs, <laughs> what support are you giving? Yeah, um, so in Church Street um, and under the regeneration umbrella particularly, I mean, we, there's elements like um, affordable workspace. So we've, you know, got a brilliant um, uh, project which offers workspace for one pound per square foot, um, you know, and, 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 and giving that workspace out to creatives and that's um, delivered by one of our operators. And at the moment, it, it's even been let to um, a local resident um, from the fashion industry. So it's, it's about th those type of things, making sure that what we're delivering, um, as, as Rachel said, is in line with what the community needs. Um, but there's also elements like the pop-up business school um, and particularly around um, the Church Street, Harrow Road area. I think on the 7th of June, we've got another virtual um, uh, you know, program that will be delivered and that sees support going into you know, more than 250 uh, whether businesses that are already start, you know, started small to medium size or budding you know, kind of entrepreneurs but uh, you know, again in, in Church Street some of our social regeneration programs really there to support people who didn't even think about entrepreneurship but actually over the last year um, you know, with, the, with COVID, with the pandemic, with the impact that we've seen on jobs Lots of people have, um, you know, kind of come through our doors um, and we've supported them either to kind of navigate the red tape of setting up a, a, you know, a company or a small enterprise or we've supported them via our Neighbourhood Keepers project to deliver on community initiatives um, for the local community around health and well-being um, or, or more kind of greener uh, environmental projects. So I think there's, there's lots that we're doing and even broader with our business and enterprise team, you know, delivering support for, for, for businesses and our Westminster Employment Services delivering kind of key um, support to, to our communities to help them get into jobs. There's, yeah, so much that's, that's being delivered. And Heather, a moment ago, we were talking about the fact that, as Serena mentions, the changing nature of what an entrepreneur is and how Westminster Connects, for example, you know, we, we have all come to do different things we didn't think we could do. Do, do you think services like Westminster Connects will be in, you know, will, could be the gateway to different kinds of work? Yeah, Westminster Connects has been also a real lifeline um, through COVID. So we set it up, uh, as you know, uh, at the very beginning of um, uh, the coronavirus uh, pandemic and um, we've had 3,000 volunteers um, register many of them have now been helped into um, uh, into jobs uh, they've been uh, really really important in making sure that the vaccination program is effective they act as COVID marshals and some of them have gone into uh, full-time work uh, in, with uh, public health and back to what Serena was saying, linking the local community in Church Street into existing enterprises uh, like the, the fabrics that are already in Church Street, the antiques market, the, there are many links that the community can make. And um, in the south of Westminster, Ebury Edge um, was set up during the pandemic, but it's fully occupied um, with small enterprises that, that are our local residents uh, setting up businesses um, and making a success of it. So uh, there's, there's so much that we can do. So, yes. As uh, Serena mentioned, the Westminster Employment Service, maybe I could just um, talk a little bit about that. I mean, especially again, during the pandemic, the role of the Westminster Employment Service has been crucial, certainly in that very first lockdown period where we, uh, where we had to house a large number of, of our rough sleeping population. The Westminster Employment Service was, uh, played a really key role in getting some of, the, some of those people who had no access to public funds into employment. Um, you talked at the beginning about, about jobs, uh, jabs into jobs, but we've actually got jobs out of jabs um, in, the, in the, a lot of the, uh, 
that we've been working with the both the, uh, the testing centres and the vaccination centres to get a lot of our residents into, into work. I went to the vaccination centre on Edgware Road. If you haven't had your vaccine, do get your vaccine. I went to the vaccination centre on Edgware Road and I was jabbed by a Westminster resident who hadn't, who'd been in the music industry, had unfortunately lost, lost her job, but was able to retrain and get new work in those vaccination centres. So the Westminster Employment Service is playing a really important role in identifying future trends, future jobs, and getting people the skills that they need into those jobs. Look at Westminster Wheels, another fantastic initiative that we have on Church Street, where, we, where we've recognised that the active transport is becoming more and more popular. So we've taken a group of young people who were not in education, not uh, in employment, and we've trained them how to be bicycle mechanics. And now they, they are um, upgrading donated bicycles in a shop on Church Street near the market, selling them on, doing repairs, and they've, and they've not just got skills for now, they've got skills for life. It's fantastic. Uh, let me float a question, rather a broad question, which I think any member of the panel might have a view on. What is happening in Oxford Street? I'm not sure if that's an allegation, a court charge or... <laughs> Debbie, what did you do with Oxford Street? I think probably what this question is getting at is our proposals around the Oxford Street District. Um, so this is a hugely important program in order to um, take an overall view of the Oxford Street District and all of the important functions it serves and the audiences that, um, that it plays to. Um, but let's face it, it needs some investment um, and has done since before the pandemic. And we've had a plan since before the pandemic. But what we've done over the last six months is, is really revamp visit that plan, inject an incredible amount of momentum and draw forward action to where it's needed. Um, so we have things happening at the moment um, on Oxford Street itself in terms of creating space for pedestrians, um, putting stacks more greenery in there. Um, we also have some exciting proposals around animation with the, the uh, sort of poster child for that being the Marble Arch Mound, which is under construction at the moment. Um, and um, we've got a whole range of initiatives from East to West Oxford Street, um, working with partners in order to um, support its ad adaptation to a post-COVID context, because Debenhams isn't coming back, Topshop isn't coming back, Crossrail is coming in. So lots is changing. And I guess we're really um, stepping up and thinking about how we can support that adaptation and work with partners to make sure um, it punches its weight with its competitor cities and competitors to districts globally and as Debbie said I mean this is so important because there's really few more iconic places right at the heart of our city than Oxford Street and the, and the surrounding area. It's what draws people into the, into the city. It's what uh, encourages people to spend money when they come here, so it's important for the local economy. But it's also an area where many people live, so it's important that we do everything we can to make it a, an enjoyable experience. But, but as Debbie was saying, it needs investment. It's been looking tired, so we need to move it forward. We need to think about What's going to encourage people to come into this area in 10 years, 20 years, 30 years time and future proof this? And I'm glad that she mentioned Marble Arch Mound because that's something, a temporary visitor attraction uh, that, we've, that we're installing. And it will serve two purposes. First, I think it will encourage people to come back to the area through this really important pro period as we come out of the, of the pandemic. But I think, but what I really hope is that it will encourage people to look afresh at that area, to see it with new eyes in the context of which it should be viewed with Marble Arch, the park next to it. We've all become a bit used to Oxford Street looking a bit down at heel, but actually it's a beautiful area right in the heart of our city and it can be made much more so. Let me put a point uh, to all the panel. Well, let me start with Matthew, actually, on this fairly broad question. What's Westminster doing to support all central businesses equally? Well, um, I mean, it, I don't, I'm not sure I actually fully agree with the premise of the question in that I think that what businesses need is, is tailored support. And that's what we're doing at the moment. We're, we're, our, um, our business unit has been offering since the beginning of the pandemic a number of one-to-one -one appointments. And we've, we've done 800 of these one-to-one -one appointments where we're, we're talking to, to businesses and we're not, whilst we want um, equality, uh, in, in the way that we support businesses, we're trying to te 
to treat each individual business in a different way. So we're listening to their concerns. We're directing them towards different sources of funding because different, source, different businesses will have access to different sources of funding. We've managed to unlock for businesses um, two million pounds worth of funding that, that, that these businesses didn't know existed until they'd had that one-on-one -on -one interview with, with, with our, 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 our business unit support team. So we're, we're trying to support different sectors in different ways and we're, and we're looking at how we, how we can do that in a, in a tailored fashion. Debbie, can I bring you in on that? Yeah, I was just going to jump in there because the question is about central London businesses and, and, and for so many of those businesses, footfall is king. Um, it means everything. And so one of the things that we have been doing is um, developing an animation strategy. Um, we'll find a better name, but internally... I was just going to say, can yeah, you explain yeah. that for, for those <laughs> yeah. who might not know the term? Um, so what that means, basically, is we wholly appreciate that for some people it's been over a year since they've come into central London and that's quite daunting. So we're trying to um, help them help them sort of make that first trip in by um, creating so many opportunities um, to surprise and delight um, and come in and and whether it's the Marble Arch Mound whether it's about art installations in the West End surprising ways to use the fabric of our city um, uh, lighting installations um, performances we obviously have West End Live um, uh, which we hope to hold this year as well so um, so a whole sort of panoply if you like of, of things happening that are intended to help people to make that journey in and reconnect with the city as well and I think that helps businesses by drawing people in um, and footfall as I said is everything to central London businesses. Serena can I just bring you in quickly we talked earlier about the, the sort of entrepreneurial companies you deal with some very imaginative and sort of exciting things I, I think your sense of it was uh, the pandemic in a strange way has been the motor for some people doing some quite creative things. Yeah, um, definitely, Fergus. I mean, I was just uh, reflecting as, as Matthew and Debbie were speaking and this kind of thinking about equality and, and, and thinking that actually for, the, for lots of businesses as well as communities, the, the impact of the pandemic hasn't, you know, kind of been the same, has it? So therefore our response can't be. And um, the, uh, within the economy team, actually working with our, our Westminster staff network, the Black, Asian and Minority um, Ethnic uh, Staff Network, to, to really look at the specific challenges uh, that BAME businesses are, are, are facing coming out of the pandemic and, and looking at a project to, you know, to look at sort of like specific support. And, and, and on Church Street, where we see, you know, quite a high level of female-led uh, very small micro businesses, but actually they, you know, they weren't sort of like in the, um, you know, they, 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 they don't have the shop units, they don't. So all of these things, you know, we've really kind of considered specifically so that we can really support them to be really thriving um, and, and as, we, as we come out of this pandemic. So I think very specific, yeah, kind of looks at, at, at different groups as well. A specific question just come in I'd like to put to Matthew and Debbie, whoever would like to take it. I'm concerned about the ever-increasing height of buildings which do nothing to improve the environment. What do you say to that? Um, well, I, I, say I, I share the concern. And um, uh, I think that what we, we've certainly said in our new city, we've said two things in our new city plan. Well, we've said more than two things, but two of the things that we've said in the new city plan is that, is that, we, we, that Westminster is not an appropriate uh, city for, for tall buildings, with the exception of our two um, opportunity areas of Victoria and Paddington. So we want to see fewer tall buildings uh, in Westminster, and the buildings that we do see, um, be they tall or otherwise, we want to have a very high grade of sustainability. Um, and that's why, in addition to the city plan, which covers sustainability and which we were um, uh, which has recently been adopted. We, we, we just launched a consultation last week on our new environmental supplementary planning document, and that will have additional measures in there on how, on how we can um, achieve our, our, our objectives, our, our climate um, objectives, because, of course, we, uh, the city declared a climate emergency uh, last year. We, we need to also... Um, uh, 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 so we need to make sure that the built environment is also supporting those objectives and helping us achieve them. So I, I don't want to see too many new tall buildings, but I want to see all our buildings, tall or small, to be sustainable. 
just a quick point. We're, we've been consulting um, recently on um, guidance for applicants, for developers, um, on how they can engage early and well with local communities, because we're really keen that the, um, the people who bring forward propositions and ideas for um, development in Westminster have got best in class engagement with local communities so that it's not just left to the sort of the statutory minimum if you see what I mean so so we're trying to help the development community by describing what we think good looks like in order that, that they can um, they can sort of work to those standards and so that we know when something comes forward for planning it already has the benefit of local community input and um, and reflects um, where the local community Community, um, think the priorities lie as well. Completely different change of subject. Rachel, you were at the theatre the other night, I think. Mm, yes. <laughs> Question has come in from a Francesca S, who says she is very excited that theatres are opening, but how is social distancing going to work? Uh, well, first, uh, may I just say to Francesca, I share her excitement because I love the theatre and it's such an important part of what makes Westminster so special, the fabulous cultural offer that we have. Um, so it's wonderful to see some of our theatres opening again and, of course, more will open um, following uh, June the 21st. It's difficult for them at the moment because they have to, to, to leave the, the, the spaces between uh, the bubbles of seats. So, for example, uh, as you mentioned, I was at the theatre uh, last week and uh, they had bubbles of twos or fours, depending on your family grouping, and then spare seats in between to, to enable the social distancing, uh, temperature checks, um, etc. as you went in. Uh, so it was very uh, one-way systems, so very well managed, very carefully managed but there is a serious point here because for many of our theatres they're going to struggle if if social distancing requirements as they are at the moment are left in place following June the 21st so for example one of our the most iconic um, uh, destinations in Britain is the Royal Albert Hall it has a seating capacity of 6,000 at the moment the maximum capacity allowed under the current rules is 1,000 they simply can't open with those rules, so that needs to be relaxed um, if they're going to be able to open. But can I just put a plug in here, and Francesca um, might be interested in this, that we're going to be launching in the summer our Inside Out programme, which is bringing all of our this amazing cultural offer in Westminster onto the streets to encourage people to be able to see it safely. Almost all of it will be free. People can come and enjoy that fabulous cultural offer outside on the streets of Westminster. Uh, on to something slightly different, back to housing. Uh, perhaps I could put this to Heather and Serena. Housing, how has that changed as a result of the pandemic? Do we now need more affordable housing in an economy which has been badly created? Heather, could you lead us well, off on that? Well, we've always needed more affordable housing and we are building more. So we've been talking tonight about the, um, the regeneration programmes that we have and we have... Um, a major one in the south um, at Ebury and a major one in the north at Church Street. Um, but we also have a number of infill programmes right across Westminster where we are building more homes for people. And actually, I think that we are, if anything, we're going to see more people wanting to live in the heart of our city. Um, as I say, there's always been plenty of demand for, for housing in Westminster uh, and we are trying to supply that, that demand. So I don't Serena, know. quick thought from you. Yeah, just um, and just b beyond affordable housing, absolutely agree totally with what Eva said. But also we've had to look at things like ensuring balconies and, and great access to, you know, outdoor space, particularly in the pandemic where people were in a lockdown situation, not having that access. So that's definitely something that we're including in in, in our developments now as well. And well, actually, it's... and also the, the green spine. We, we must, we yes. must mention that. In, Sorry, uh, please do in Church Street. So um, uh, this is um, a lot of open space that will provide greenery, it will improve air quality, uh, it provides play space. And as Serena says, um, our health and well-being, it's been really recognised the need for greenery and open space during COVID. And that's what we're yeah. giving at, um, at Church Street. 
Well, it's small local businesses as well as the big names who are leading the way in reviving Westminster. The second chance coffee stop in Church Street is building its brand as commuters return. Westminster's Anne Stevens went to meet the owner. Hi, my name is Peter um, and I run Second Chance. We are a small coffee shop selling Ugandan coffee, fresh juices and pastries. Uh, the markets have been impacted a lot through lockdown, so it's lovely to see the market full again and I've certainly got a lot more customers, especially with the traders coming in the morning getting their coffees. We put in extra safety measures in place, everything's handled with gloves, we've got sanitizer uh, um, out on all the counters for the customers to use and we do encourage it. Uh, I've been in hospitality for a long time so I've got quite a good knowledge of health and safety and hygiene. The thing I most look forward to now that we've opened back again is obviously getting everyone to taste the coffee. We're a new company so we're giving out uh, flyers and leaflets and we're really hoping to, to grow some great loyalty. Rachel, lead us off on your reaction to that. I thought it's wonderful um, and, uh, yeah, it's fantastic. Serena. Have you tried the coffee? <laughs> yes. No, I haven't. <laughs> yes. It does. Yeah, it does. Yeah, indeed. It does. Uh, yeah. Serena, very quick point. You know Church Street better than anyone here. Uh, <laughs> is this the kind of place the entrepreneurs of the future will come from? Absolutely, absolutely. And, you know, we're so happy to host um, Second Chance. Um, and, and, you know, it's, it's all about these kind of social uh, enterprises with a story. Um, and, and this particular, you know, we, we, we spoke with him and, you know, he said he went to um, Africa at a time when he was going through quite a rough period in his life. Um, and so this is his uh, way of, of, of giving back. Um, and, uh, you know, also supporting sort of like addiction recovery objectives as well. So absolutely, the, you know, you know, wonderful business to have. And it's, and it's just um, not too far from our, our office on Church Street as well. So that's good. Uh, something fairly broad brush now, which Rachel, I think you could lead us off on. Um, one questioner says they think that uh, is there a risk residents are being forgotten in the rush back to normal? Um, there's a lot of talk about what we're doing for businesses. Um, absolutely not. And it's really important to stress that obviously this evening we're focusing on, on businesses as the theme of, of this. But it's really important to say that we have continued throughout to support all of our residents. So all of our services have continued. But also we've been driving ahead with the themes that have been that our residents have told us are really important for them. So particularly on the green agenda, uh, climate change, tackling air quality. I'm really delighted that just recently we've launched, uh, we've uh, installed our thousands, one thousands um, EV charging point electrical vehicle charging point um, and we're due to have another 500 by next spring so that's making it easier and easier for residents to switch to electrical vehicle electric vehicles which is going to be a key issue in terms of helping them to to tackle um, air quality so throughout we've continued to drive ahead with with these agendas that are important to our residents and by the way when we talk about businesses it's important to stress that this is also about creating employment and making sure that our residents have jobs one of the things I'm really concerned about is our youth unemployment rate which is currently running at 12 and a half percent that is a real concern for me a lot of those jobs have been lost in the hospitality sector in the creative industries so that's why it's so important that we do everything we can to help those businesses to create to recover to, to, to create those jobs again. Well, twinned with that, second question on the same theme, it, what is, can the council do anything to encourage employees to bring back their employees safely? Perhaps Rachel and Matthew for that. Um, I, I think what we can do is just to create the opportunities to, uh, to, for businesses to be able to operate again um, and, and be creating enough opportunities that they it's, it's worth their while to bring staff back. Uh, we're also working closely with TfL so that they can um, do more to it to promote the safety of, of public transport. They're actually doing that uh, itself in terms of testing etc but they need to do more in terms of the messaging so that people feel confident office workers feel confident about coming back um, but yes we would we would really encourage people to be bringing those staff back um, but part of it is them having enough business and uh, to be able to do that Matthew do, do we feel confident yet I, I'm, I always feel confident Fergus but I think that the um, 
the, the thing that we need to do is to, is to listen to what the office workers are saying. And, and there have been a number of surveys done. Um, and one of the things that office workers are saying is that in order to get them back into the office, they need a vibrant um, environment. They're, they're, people are unlikely to rush back to an industrial estate in Hemel Hempstead. Um, but what they will do, come back for is, is if they want to come back to low-rise buildings, they feel safer in low-rise buildings. Again, Westminster has a lot of those. They want access to green space. We have huge amounts of green space across our, our, our city, and we're adding to those green spaces, as, as Debbie was talking about, on Oxford Street. Um, and they also want this vibrant and vibrant atmosphere. So they, they want access to culture, as, uh, uh, as Rachel was talking to about the theatre. And I can say to, to Francesca, uh, the, the great thing about social distancing in theatres is that, is that they've taken out a lot of the seats. So for someone who's six foot five, it's a very good place to sit. So if you're a taller person, do go to the theatre now when there's social distancing. So they want, they want um, uh, access to culture. They want access to, to hospitality. So that's another reason why it's been so important for us to add those 13,000 extra seats of alfresco dining that have really given our hospitality industry, uh, industry not just that support, but added that vibrancy to the city. So I think that if we continue to do the, the, things, the things that we're doing, adding, making our, our, our city cultural through in, inside out, um, making our city vibrant through alfresco, and also giving, giving people the reasons to, to, to come back into the city safely, um, uh, also through our green spaces, that we will see um, more and more people come back voluntarily. It won't be something that the, that, the, that the businesses have to force people or encourage people to do. They will naturally come back. Matthew, that was an impassioned response, but one which hasn't impressed our next questioner, uh -huh. who says to you, are you making any practical involvement in Oxford Street rather than aesthetics? Council taxpayers aren't interested in gimmicks like the mound. Are you in the market of gimmicks, Matthew? Well, I think I, I, wouldn't, I wouldn't call it an, uh, a gimmick, and I wouldn't say that, that aesthetics are not practical investments. I think that, as, as Debbie was saying, so many of our businesses um, uh, rely on footfall. One in 10 Londoners are employed in the West End. Um, as, as, as Rachel was saying earlier, that, that there is not, it's a, it's a false choice between businesses and residents because the businesses provide jobs for our residents and that's what, that's what we want to see. So what we're doing is we're trying to increase footfall into the West End to, to save the jobs that we already have. It's much harder to create new jobs. We have, um, uh, hundreds of thousands of jobs in the West End, 80,000 of them in hospitality alone. And we need to protect those jobs and we need to do things. That doing nothing is not an option. Um, somebody earlier talked about, are we going back to normal? Back to normal is not an option because already we saw footfall going down in the West End. So we have to think of ideas be it these uh, pocket parks, these greenways that we're adding into the Oxford Street scheme. And yes, that includes the Marble Arch Mound. I think it will be a fantastic thing that will draw families into the centre of, of London because we, we're not, most of us are not getting a, a, foreign, a foreign holiday this year. So if you can't climb a, an Alp in Switzerland, why not come to Marble Arch and go up the Marble Arch Mound? That is an almost unique sales pitch. <laughs> it is, actually. But just also to add on that, you know, the, re the real uh, investments being made in improving air quality, as, as Matthew said, improving the greening in the area, in the, in the squares, in the pocket parks, and that's going to be something that's really uh, wonderful for residents who live around there as well as, as well as for visitors. Well, that actually ties neatly into the next question, which, again, uh, really could be one for all of the panel. Couldn't the absence of visitors be used as an opportunity to improve services, safety and the environment for residents. Debbie, that's a bit of a global question. Do you fancy a go at that? I mean, I think I'll, I'll have a go and then look forward to my colleagues' comments. Um, uh, you know, I think... I mean, I joined the council last July, and one of the things that I've been really struck with is the amount of learning that has taken place within the council as a result of the pandemic. Um, so the, the word pivot is used everywhere. Every single service has pivoted like mad in order to be able to respond to the needs of, of residents in the borough um, and support businesses who have been in crisis. So, um, and there's a huge amount of learning. So we've, we've done loads, um, but there's a huge amount of learning there. Um, you heard Heather talking about Westminster Connect. 
works, which was born in the pandemic and we intend to keep and think about how we can continue to use that model to deliver for the borough. So I'm not sure if I'm totally answering the question, but I think you know there's a lot we've done in the pandemic, um, huge amount of pivoting, but we've, we've really learned and we're trying to bottle that learning and build upon it. Um, Matthew made the point, it's not about going back to normal. And that is as true of everybody in this building and all of our offices as it is for the world out there as well. And um, just to add on what Debbie said, you know, one of the things that is so important to our residents is, is the green agenda and improving air quality. We know in Westminster, 86% of our emissions come from our buildings. So actually, as we've, we've taken this opportunity to do a huge amount of work over the year into how we can, how we can set out how people can build more sustainably and use buildings more sustainably. And that's why the environmental supplementary planning document, which is out for consultation at the moment, is so important. In very uh, 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 layman's terms, which suits me, it's how we can build in a, in a greener way, in a more sustainable way, so that our buildings and the way that we use them support, support uh, the climate. Infrastructure of the city uh, is interested. One of our questions, perhaps Rachel and Matthew, for this one. Not happy with the state of broadband. Why is it being rolled out unevenly? Well, it brought, I, it, un, um, I, uneven is not necessarily something that I that I that I can address. But I'm I'm happy uh, if uh, uh, if we if if we talk about which area it is to look into that. But. Um, We've had a dramatic transformation in the speed of broadband um, uh, rolling out in, in Westminster. I think that um, n about two years ago, we were one of the lowest ranked boroughs in London, if not in the entire country. Now we're number one for, bro for, for broadband uh, rollout in the city. Now, unevenness is something that we want to, we want to address every, um, everywhere. We want to make sure that everybody has um, access to that high quality broadband, which is so important, especially at a time when people have been studying from home, working, working from home. But of course, it's about working with those, with those partner networks. And uh, there are some, some uh, areas of the city that are le less accessible than, than others. But our ambition is to make sure that we have high quality broadband across our city. And, and we're making strides in achieving that. Transport and infrastructure come together in the next question, which I'd like to put to you, Serena. There's a Victoria Circus at the station Piccadilly, an Oxford Circus. Do we need a Church Street Circus station? No. I feel strangely confident of your no, answer. it's not a station, it's a circus. <laughs> uh, I, and I think, sorry, Serena, no. but I think this is a fantastic idea, Church Street Circus. An actual circus. Um, well, I mean, <laughs> it's the name, it's the name. And actually, we do have, there are some really exciting things coming to Church Street, which we can't yeah. necessarily talk about now, but why not have ch uh, Church Street Circus? I mean, Victoria Circus is is not just the station is it so um uh I, yeah i think it's a great idea don't you serena yeah i mean i, I absolutely love this question fergus um <laughs> complete endorsement but you know kind of more, more importantly it's, it's all about the identity of church street isn't it and it and it does have an identity and through the regeneration program what we're trying to do is is really kind of um improve and amplify that because there's already visitors coming from far and wide, you know, to come and buy the spices to, you know, it's, it's such a vibrant place. But I think, yeah, by giving it a, a, a name like that, you know, um, on, yeah, no, on thank the, the you train station. Person. Yeah, we'll, brilliant. We'll think about that. Yeah, <laughs> definitely. I think that just got commissioned, Rachel. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> but actually, you know, isn't that great? This is yeah. what, one of the great things coming out of, you know, to have this engagement yeah. with residents, that these wonderful ideas coming out. So, yeah, that's something we'll take away. One question just came up, um, perhaps like to, <coughs> to Matthew and Heather. The question was asking uh, to support business in the city, would the council support a happy hour at 6 p.m. in the evening? Oh, absolutely. <laughs> I say, <laughs> this is gin. Um, <laughs> It's not actually. <laughs> <laughs> no, I, I, um, I, 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 I think that we need um, uh, that we we, and that's what has been great about our alfresco dining dining scheme. I think that we we we've added, as I said, thirteen thousand extra seats to um, to our city. These are seats that didn't exist before before because we haven't had the you know. Frankly, I think the English climate has not necessarily made uh, um, London the, the, the first choice for alfresco dining. But in that period, from April to May, where, business, where, where hospitality businesses 
couldn't have everybody, anybody inside. We were able to add those 13,000 seats into our city, which have generated, we, we think, as a, as a conservative es estimate, around 1.3 million pounds a day. Um, and I've seen people out on the streets of Soho, out on the streets of, uh, uh, of Covent Garden, and be it at three, four, five, or six o'clock, they've all been happy. So I'm pleased to at least to have, to have supported our hospitality industry in, in, giving, in giving not just a happy hour, but a happy week and a happy month and hopefully a, a happy spring and summer to come. Heather, how do you feel about that? I mean, the question obviously means it in a light way, but, but support for, for our hostelries in that way. Well, as Matthew has outlined, we've given fantastic support to, um, to our hostelries. Um, and a happy hour sometimes implies that um, prices for drink would be lower at six o'clock and maybe some of our businesses would not necessarily... Uh, want that. Let, let's have, uh, as Matthew says, uh, every evening be a, a happy evening where um, all our residents um, are, are happy to go and um, uh, take partake of, of all our amazing hostelries and our galleries, our theatres, um, our um, dance halls, opera, everything. Well, to get people into the city, obviously, some may wish to drive. Uh, our next question is asking, what's the panel's view on the extension of the congestion charge over the weekend and the evening? Rachel, do you want to lead off on that? Look, this is a difficult one because there's no doubt that with the extension of the congestion charge at the time that it, it came, it just was yet another blow for businesses because it was at a time when people were nervous about public transport and so therefore having the charge um, to, to come into central London was yet another reason why they would stay away. So so there's no doubt that it, that it hindered business. What we need to do going forward is to make sure that other forms of transport are much easier easier and accessible and people have confidence in them. So improve public transport, but also make sure that people have way other ways of being able to travel around. So make it easier for people to walk, yes, cycle, but, but also to use other forms of, of transport to get around um, so that they can move more safely around the city. Uh, one, once people are here, this is almost a sort of a civil liberties question, which I put to any member of the panel. Uh, one question asking, vaccine certificates might give reassurance to people going into theatres or, for that matter, any other kind of venue. Matthew, do you think the public would stand for showing a vaccine certificate when they go into a venue? Well, I think the government said that they're, they're not going to be introducing vaccine certificates for, for those kind of... Uh, uh, for those kind of environments, but certainly what we've seen in the in the trial, uh, the trial events where people had to take a, uh, a PCR test before they went into a, uh, a mass event uh, like the uh, uh, FA Cup final, or, or I think there was a rave in Liverpool as well. That people um, taking a PCR test before that event and then a PCR test afterwards to ensure that the event is as safe as possible. That might be something that we see uh, for large scale events um, uh, going forward if the virus. Um, um, uh, uh, is is endemic in 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 uh, uh, in the society in society for a number of months to come. But I, I think that that vaccine passports um, are are controversial. I think that that they not everybody. Um, um, wants to take up the vaccine, although I do encourage people to do that. Not everybody is able to take up that vaccine. So I don't think vaccine passports are, uh, are what, we're, what we're going to see, what we want to see, but there could be some form of testing to get into larger venues going forward. Yeah. Uh, something now, a, a very serious subject, which has been widely reported and talked about, which is mental health during the pandemic, feelings of loneliness. Uh, and the question is asking, what's the council's plan on improving people's mental health and reducing feelings of loneliness. Serena, you were nodding quite yeah. thoroughly there. What's your thought? Yeah, I was, I was just thinking about, um, again, one of our um, neighbourhood keepers uh, projects, which was a Zumba, um, Zumba Gold, so um, delivers uh, Zumba classes to the over 50s. And, and pre-pandemic, you know, people would come out and, and meet together and it was a, a way of um, addressing sort of like social isolation. And, and when the pandemic hit, um, of course, you know, that was a challenge, but the provider quickly moved that to online. And actually, um, just hearing back from some of the participants speaking about how, you know, this was their lifeline for the week where they could kind of, yeah, just albeit virtually, but connect with, you know, their friends. Um, and, you know, so really, really important. And something else that we're doing um, 
in Church Street and, and, and across um, Harrow Road as well is uh, our team of community development officers have been out in the community researching with the community to find out what you know what has been the impact from from uh, you know COVID and 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 actually what type of communities would they like to see sort of like going forward because we really want to work as Rachel mentioned before with our communities in a co-production you know way to um, to make sure that whatever we deliver is is completely what they need so I think it's a really important um, area and I know adult social care are also doing you know, kind of lots, um, our Westminster Connects, uh, you know, by the phone calls that they were making to people during the pandemic, also trying to, you know, kind of um, address some of some of those impacts there as well. Yeah, West, Westminster Connects um, had a, uh, an extensive programme of um, telephoning everyone who was um, having to self-isolate. And uh, that's, that has also been a lifeline for many people. And friendships have been forged through the volunteers mm. um, ringing um, on a regular basis, uh, those people who did feel lonely. Um, and so uh, one benefit, if you like, coming out of um, COVID has been this strengthening of our communities mm. um, and linking people together. Um, and, and so, we will build on Westminster Connects to make sure that that, that strengthening continues and, and hopefully will help address uh, people's uh, mental well-being. And the, the greening that we've been talking about, we know will also be a factor in improving uh, people's well-being. Debbie, is it possible to, uh, possibly a daft question, but can you actually design in, in a city ways that increase feelings of community? Um, open space is one obviously but yeah I absolutely think you can and and I think this is something we've got a, a profound responsibility to do and I think this is um, one of the reasons I spoke earlier about the involvement of communities early on in the process because they have the best knowledge of how their community works how people walk from A to B what the important meeting spots are and these things are not obvious when you look at a map or um, or you know you sit in an office looking at um, looking at plans so I think for me, um, good development is built upon a very deep understanding of the local community and how a development um, can stitch into the local community, if I can put it that way. Um, and it, so it's for exactly that reason that we are encouraging developers and in our own development, we work really hard um, to, um, to do that work, which is why we've got um, Serena and her team on the ground in Church Street talking to the local communities so we can take that information into the process of change from, from the development that we're bringing forward in that area. Thank you for that. Time now for two quick questions to finish before we get a thought from all of our panellists. Matthew, quick one from you, questioner asking, Westminster Council, does it give permission rather easily to luxury property builders, often from abroad? Um, uh, no, it doesn't. Um, we, uh, with the new city plan, which has just been adopted, we've actually increased um, uh, the, the percentage of affordable housing to 35% that needs to be provided in, in each of our developments. And, and I think if you look at the, the, the council is also a developer and we're developing a large number of properties and, and perhaps Heather or Serena or, or Debbie would like to talk about those. But then the percentage of the percentage of affordable housing in those developments, of which there are many, is even higher. So I, I wouldn't accept that, that, it, that, it's, uh, that, that it is about luxury developments. It really is about building houses for, pe for our residents and it's so important since the pandemic that we're building those houses for our nurses, for our, our supermarket workers, our delivery drivers. And, and that's what that 35% affordable is there to do. Debbie, did you want to? Uh, uh, just a quick point. I think there's a really interesting innovation, which I think, I think Westminster is the first people to do it in the city plan that's just been approved of a maximum size of a housing unit. Um, so um, so, so what, uh, basically what it says is that we won't grant permission for a housing use unit over a certain size. Um, and so um, it, there's a limit to what we can do in planning, as Matthew's just described, in terms of the economics of units that get built. But actually what we've said through that planning policy is actually we don't think it is appropriate to swallow up so much real estate in one residential unit so and I think I think that's an innovation let's claim it I think we're the only people doing that one last question before we get a closing thought fairly generally well pretty universal Rachel Robotham what does the new normal look like <laughs> well 
I don't know, but I, I, I think uh, what I can say is that we probably need to work harder to showcase what is so amazing about our city to encourage people to come back here. Um, so it's not enough anymore for us to sit back and let there be growth. And our only problem is how we manage that growth. Now we have to think about how we support our businesses and support uh, those job creating um, industries to actually be able to operate. So when we talked earlier about the animation strategy, about bringing culture out onto the street, that's all about how, how we actually help to drive domestic tourism. In the past, we had you know, so much international tourism, we almost didn't need to worry. So now it's about how we how we draw that domestic tourism in the country into 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 Westminster to 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 enjoy everything that's here on offer. And but some things will be the same. We've got a beautiful city. We've got you know the most fabulous heritage. We've got a an iconic cultural sector, the best cultural. I'm going to say this. It's you know the most richest cultural sector of anywhere. I think. Um, and so we. Need to just you know remind people that that's here that's on offer and that uh, and that they can come back and enjoy that safely matthew you look like you're straining to contribute at that point i, I know i never strain fergus <laughs> um uh, I, I think it goes back to that, that that aphorism beloved of management consultants that the chinese word for crisis is the same one as the chinese word for opportunity <laughs> and i think that actually that the that the pandemic has given us as um uh, a real opportunity and that's an opportunity to continue the work that actually westminster city council has been doing to deliver our four pillars of our city for all and i think that what we will see in the in the new normal is is that those those objectives um of 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 a, a green city, a smart city, a city with vibrant communities, a city with a thriving economy, we will be able to fulfill those objectives easier, more easily in the, in, in the new normal. And I think that that's what our residents want, us to, want, want to see us do. And I think that we have to absolutely take that opportunity of, of this restart of this new normal to, to deliver those objectives. Well, we're coming to the end of our time. It's been a great discussion with some excellent questions in. I would like to conclude really by asking one final closing thought from everyone on what we've discussed tonight and the questions we've had in. Debbie, could I start with you? Uh, yes, of course. And they've been great, great questions. I really enjoyed um, the debate. I think I think for me, the word for the night is adaptation um, and how uh, and our role as a council in supporting the adaptation of the city's economy in order that it can can continue to support the jobs um, and the thriving place that we all love um, that, um, that it was, but in a new way. Um, and so I think adaptation is my word for the night. Serena, give us a word for the night. Oh, God, I don't know if I can come up with a thanks for that, Debbie. Um, uh, but what I was just going to say, just uh, really for any small or medium-sized enterprises, um, particularly in, in the Church Street, Harrow Road area, uh, just remember that the pop-up business school is running on the 7th of June. So if you're interested, get in contact. And um, the new normal means our residents benefiting from everything that we have in Westminster uh, and making sure that um, so residents and young people, I mean, we do hear about young people who've never been into the West End. So we need to make sure we've got fantastic schools in Westminster. Uh, we've got fantastic support into employment. Uh, we also need to make sure that all our residents can have that opportunity to benefit from the culture, from all the activities that, that we have uh, going on in Westminster and uh, making it a really healthy, pleasant and happy hour place to be. Um, and I think that, that just because I didn't have a chance to talk about it in any, any of the questions that was, were asked to me, I, I want to talk about our um, pop-up activation program. So Serena already talked uh, about uh, the, the pop-up business school, which again, for, for those entrepreneurs, if you are interested, do sign up for that. We have uh, a great pop-up activation program across the West End um, in order to use those empty units that unfortunately we have uh, uh, too many of at the moment. But we want to, to turn those units into something that is not only attractive uh, for, for people to, to come into the city and look at or to, to visit, but we, we want to support them. We want to help to su support um, the next generation of artists and the next generation of entrepreneurs. So um, from next month, we'll be, we'll 
be introducing new pop-ups in the St. James's area that are supporting emerging artists, and they'll be going in, into uh, some units uh, in that part of the city, and they'll have some really um, interesting uh, um, uh, pop-ups for people to come and visit and to, to, to look at art and to buy art. Um, we'll also, uh, we've also just launched a call for applications for fashion and wellness pop-ups, so please uh, go to your search engine and, and look for Westminster Business Unit pop-ups, and there, there's an opportunity, if you are a fashion business, to, to, have, a, to, to, to have your business in the unit um, in the heart of the West End, so there's lots of opportunities for there. Again, you know, as the city rises like a phoenix from the, uh, from, from the pandemic. Rachel, closing word from you. I think, look, there's been some incredibly uh, tough periods over the last year, but there's also been some real positives. And for me, as leader of the council, one of the great things for me is that we're working even more closely with our residents, with our businesses, with our faith groups, with our cultural institutions. And that's given us a much greater understanding of what's really important in terms of our priorities and driving ahead with those. And I want to be really clear on that. And in terms of in terms of words for the evening, I, I can't say it in a single one, but actually I thought the, the person who uh, suggested Church Street Circus, what a, what a great idea to sum up that here we are, we're working with the residents of Church Street to regenerate and reinvigorate their area and build on everything that's fabulous there at the moment. And wouldn't that be a great, uh, a great legacy to have Church Street Circus? Well, with that legacy, can I say thank you to everyone who's joined us and asked a question this evening. We've got through as many questions as we can. And can we assure you, we will get back to everyone who's put a point to us. We hope to see you at our next Open Forum event soon. But until then, it's good evening from everyone here at Westminster City Hall. <laughs>